you're with Scott. It's ASMR time. It's midnight. It's always midnight. Uh, I went to the second hand bookshop and I got a book called Whisper Town. This book has come from Brisbane, uh, from the Red Cross Library originally. And I'm going to read Whisper Town, ironically, in my normal voice. <laughs> this is called Reading with Ruby. This is called Reading with Ruby. So Ruby's here. And you're here. And I'm going to read the book to you and to Ruby. And this is your right ear. And this is your left ear. Now, I haven't read the book before. I've only had a quick look at some of the things printed on the inside. The cover. I bought it because it was called Whisper Town. And it does say, the characters, places, incidents and situations in this book are imaginary and have no relation to any person, place or actual happening. <laughs> so let's get that clear from the start. This is fiction. <laughs> Whisper Town might turn out to be fantastically true to life, uh, maybe for some people. And if you feel like I'm describing uh, characters, or even if they have the same names as people that you know, um, the same names and the same personalities, then I can assure you that Whisper Town is it's imaginary and it has no relation to any person, place, or actual happening. I can promise you that. Well, going on what it says on the inside of the book. Whisper Town was published in 1960 in America. So this is going to be a, the, my first read through. I'll, I'll confess, I have read the first page um, just to do a sound check. So this is going to be my first read through. And I'm going to give you the, uh, <laughs> the director's commentary, which is me talking about Whisper Town to you as I read it to you. Should we go here? So, Whisper Town, a red badge mystery novel by Judson Phipps. Chapter 1. There came a point after Sarah Woodling had taken on a certain number of drinks when he developed double vision. It was an irritating fact that he couldn't judge in advance exactly what the number of drinks would be. He couldn't just tell the bartender at the Rock City Club not to serve him after he'd had, say, nine drinks. The phenomenon of double vision was not arrived at so precisely. Sometimes it might take 15 drinks complicated by the length of time needed for consumption. He usually became aware of it by the sight of two elderly, gross-looking fat men staring back at him from the mirror behind the bar. The shock was not the vision of the identical twins smoking identical cigars and holding identical old-fashioned glasses in liver-spotted hands. The shock was that either one of those twins had to be Sarah Woodling. By closing one eye, he could eliminate one of the twins, but it was still Sarah Woodling, staring back at Sarah Woodling. And I'm just going to come with a little bit of commentary there, because I feel the, uh, the author, Judson Phillips, in this case, has used um, quite a nice device here to uh, 
Drill Home, the name of the title character here, Sarah Woodling, and sorry, the title character, the, the title, <laughs> it's Whisper Town. Um, but Sarah Woodling, yeah, he's, uh, he's been mentioned by name a few times, so. And he's also managed to tell you that he's got liver spotted hands and he's on the drinks there, so getting a bit of a, building up a bit of a picture of the old guy here now. And, uh, yeah, he'd be gross looking. <laughs> Sorry, my eyes are a bit funny because I'm tired. Yeah, gross, gross looking. Gross looking fat man. So, Woodling. Like I said, I haven't checked through this book, so who knows what's going to happen. Interesting, huh? Should have drawn attention to my life. After looking one eyed, no, hello, hello. After looking one eyed at the reflection in the glass, he sometimes spoke to Eddie, the club bartender. It always went about the same way. <laughs> Should I do the voices? Uh, I don't know who this voice is. Uh, okay. Well, after looking one eyed at the reflection in the glass, he sometimes spoke to Eddie, the club bartender. It always went about the same way. Take the advice of an old timer, Edward Knight. <laughs> oh, I see he's talking to Edward, yeah, okay, so this is an old fat man, yeah. Take the advice of an old timer, Edward never acquired serious taste for alcoholic beverages. Did I ever tell you I was voted the handsomest man in my college class? That's how he speaks now. He would close both eyes for a moment and then blink them open, hopefully. Staring back at him would be the fat twins, flabby lips wrapped around their cigars. Oh, hang on, how should he talk, really? Yeah. Took the advice of an old timer, Edward, and never acquire a serious taste for alcoholic beverages. Did I ever tell you I was voted the handsomest man in my college class? That's better, isn't it, with the, with the lips, yeah. He would close both eyes for a moment and then blink them open, hopefully. Staring back at him would be the fat twins, mm -hmm. flabby lips wrapped around their cigars, mm -hmm. eyes bloodshot over heavy dark bags, mm -hmm. faces deeply lined, heavy jowls mm -hmm. under once square chins. So, uh, <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't say his name again. Can you remember it? <laughs> the appearance of the twins in the mirror invariably drove Sayer Woodling out of the club for the night. <laughs> He could not stand the sight of them. That, that's him. Right, yeah. Right, this might be a good opportunity to just reset the Ruby cam. So, just one sec. on the DSLR and uh, I should I could mention there's a soundtrack in the background we've got the crickets on just to cover up some of that annoying background noise in the kitchen fridges and such anyway back to the world of whisper town <laughs> what's happening there say woodling just left the club for the night His routine was regular. He would drive from the club up over Cobbs Hill into the main part of town. Liquor store. Now, in the UK, we call it. We don't call it liquor. Liqueur. <laughs> Copy liqueur, sir. So, um, but it's you know clearly supposed to be liquor, isn't it? So it's a red badge mystery. We'd, we'd be incomplete without the pronunciation of liquor. <laughs> I don't know, maybe we should pronounce it like that in the UK. Maybe we do. Maybe I'm wrong. His routine was regular. He would drive from the club up over Cobbs Hill into the main part of town. Liquor stores were usually closed by the time double vision set in, but there was Timothy's Bar and Grill open until 2am. <laughs> in my world, you know, it's always midnight. But I have been known to stay up later than 2am. Um, and certainly, you know, I think... Uh, this hardened, hardened old drinker would probably be able to get, get a bit further past 2am with me, but 
anyway. Timothy would always sell, say, a, a bottle of bourbon. So it came in a brown paper bag, like off the telly. I put that in. And Timothy would announce loudly. No, I, I didn't put the whole brown paper bag thing in, I just. Okay. And Timothy would announce loudly for the benefit of customers. Rare hamburger. No, sorry. Sorry. And Timothy would announce loudly for the benefit of customers. Rare hamburger and a kind of milk to go. <laughs> Sometimes, when he was feeling gay, Timothy would elaborate by saying, Frog's legs are quite in and a hot chocolate to go. <laughs> or if there's no one there, here's your panther juice, judge. Sorry, sorry. It's bedtime, yeah. The mirror back of Timothy's bar had been soaked to keep out the reflection of an ornate chandelier, and thus the twins never appeared there. It's a nice little touch, isn't it? Timothy's pace was comforting at times. Leaving the Rock City Club eliminated the twins. <laughs> All right, these twins, fucking hell. <laughs> no, don't, don't swear. <laughs> this is relaxing video time, don't swear. Don't sw keep, keep it nice. Uh, leaving the rock. Well, this is kind of like you know neo noir maybe. Who knows? I don't know what this book's going to be like. So. <laughs> maybe some something a bit appropriate. Not certain other people's problems created by Dumbledore. Uh, leaving the Rock City Club eliminated the twins, but not certain other problems created by Double Vision. Leaving the Rock City Club eliminated the twins, but not certain other problems created by Double Vision. It made the driving of Sayers' ancient Buick a matter of scientific speculation. There would be two white lines down the centre of the highway, and an approaching car had four headlights. By closing his left eye, Sayer could eliminate two headlights and one white line. <laughs> I'll check this. So, um, I've had a right faff trying to record a video tonight. And uh, I delete, I deleted it all because it was just going badly. This right here, this is some chilled out, vibesy stuff. So um, the fact that my eye feels a bit tired, and I know I'm going to look like a goof on camera with it. <laughs> I'm just going to roll with that one, you know. <laughs> this eye. I had a car crash and uh, I had a stitch, stitches, like seven of them, across my eye. So that's just going to look like that, you know. But this one, these are tired eyes. These are tired eyes. I can see myself in the camera, in your eyes. I can see myself reflected in your eyes. Over there. <laughs> Get back to uh, Whisper Town because that's what it's all about, really. Whisper Town. So, see, I'm not, I'm not going to worry about that. I mean, I'm not going to draw attention to it, of course. Not, not on the internet. <laughs> he's driving his ancient Buick, and he's got his eye, one eye open anyway. By closing his left eye, Sayer could eliminate two headlights and one white line. The single white line that remained would jump sharply to his right. If he closed his right eye, it would switch to the left. Cobbs Hill presented difficulties. It was a steep climb straight up for nearly a month. <laughs> straight up. Does he... I wonder if the author's... It was a steep climb straight up, as in, like, for real, or whether he really means that... <laughs> He's got a vision of a car trying to drive up a side of the building. So it was a steep climb straight up for nearly a mile and a half. The valves in the old Buick with its manual shift would begin to ping about halfway up and Sarah would have to shift. Another problem was that cars coming down the hill were usually exceeding the <laughs> cars coming down the hill were usually exceeding the speed limit by considerable and Sarah kept his left eye tight. Honestly, I'm just going to take a photo of this and show you guys. 
that's what it says. Um, another problem is that cars coming down the hill were usually exceeding the speed limit by considerable. You know, it should say something else there in a sentence, really. And Sayer uh, kept his left eye tightly closed, knowing the white line would move to the right, and that by staying on his side of it, he would be well over on the edge of the road. There's just some confusing stuff here now. If he ever got in the way of one of those speeders coming down the hill, there wouldn't be anything left of the Buick or him. So, uh, Okay, Judson. Judson. On Friday night in October, the Mirror Twins had driven Sarah out of the Rock City Club and started him on his pilgrimage up Cobbs Hill towards Timothy's place in town. It's a bit of a recap for you. He was about of a third <laughs> he was about of a third of the way up back on the fucking hill climb. He was about <laughs> a third of the way up the hill when he saw four headlights bang down on him. He closed his left eye and moved over to his side of the road. At the same time the Buick was pinging away dangerously. I thought we'd just done this and he reached for the gear lever to put her in second. Somehow he missed his fumbling search for the lever. He swore softly and opened both eyes to hunt for it in the gloom. So here's a good thing if you're trying to uh, fill up space in a book, which is to write one paragraph and then just repeat it next. Probably, I'm confused. Is, is he gonna have a crash now or what? He swore softly and opened both eyes to hunt for it in the gloom. He found it, shifted, and looked up. Four headlights were almost on top of him. He quickly closed an eye. His left. His bad eye. His left eye. Yeah. So, uh, the white line jumped to the right. He must be almost in a ditch, he thought, and turned the wheel sharply to the left. Too late, he realised that he'd miscalculated. The headlights were in front of him. A horn cried warning. With all his might, Sayer slammed his wheel over to the right. It's getting exciting. The other car went hurtling past, tyres screeching, and Sayer thought he heard a woman scream. With his right eye closed, he glanced up into his rear view mirror. The tail light of the other car was careening crazily across the road. The car was headed straight for the embankment. The tail light rose in the air. There was a splintering crash, a sudden burst of flame. I didn't expect that, to be honest. It's a red sword off the road. <laughs> the car's exploded. And if there was a movie, that'd make quite a um, punchy opening sequence, I guess. Uh, some fat old man <laughs> getting in a car, driving it up a hill, running someone off the road, their car flipping and bursting into flame. Sweat ran down the inside of Sarah Woodling's clothes. No other car was coming towards him, nor could he see any headlights coming up behind him. <laughs> Sarah Woodling's mind worked with an awful clarity. Oh. If he went back to help, they'd know it was his car that had driven them off the road. The state police would come, and even though Lieutenant Hogan, or the Hulk to his friends, <laughs> in charge of the barracks, was his friend, who was his, so he called him the Hulk, <laughs> they'd know he was drunk. Yeah, Hogan wouldn't be able to cover up for him. Not with other witnesses who'd bound to collect. Oh, sorry, the Ruby cam has just gone off, so let's flip that back on because this is reading with Ruby, of course. What was I, I was saying, um, Lieutenant Hulk Hogan from the state police would. Uh, and they'd know he was drunk. He, he wouldn't be able to cover up for him, not with the other witnesses who'd be bound to collect. But to be fair, I thought that um, Sarah Woodling was the only person on the road, so it'd be pretty fair to assume that he could just go down there and say, oh, I've just arrived. Like, he could even park his car and just go out and have a look and be like, I haven't, I haven't been driving. So um, there's no witnesses to, to speak of. I don't know how many Hogan would collect. Um, there'd be an automatic suspension of his license, maybe worse. So this kind of implies that he's in with Lieutenant Hulk Hogan and that um, Sarah Woodling, uh, uh, Sarah Woodling put his foot down hard on the accelerator 
and the old Buick zoomed up the hidden second away from the sound of screams. So we're learning about Sarah would be nice that he's a bit of a he might be with the police, but he might not be such a good guy, you know. So what about what's that? Chapter one. Well, quite a short introduction there to the life of Sarah Woodling. <laughs> Drunken maniac. Ready for some chapter two. With his right eye tightly closed. <laughs> So we haven't gone anywhere, you know, we're still with, <laughs> with his right eye tightly closed, Sarah Woodling breasted Cogshill and shifted into high, and shifted into high, moving rapidly down the lesser grade on the other side into town. No car came his way. I was kind of expecting just to go and see somebody else, just to be introduced to some of the part of the town or the story in chapter two there. Once I knew that Sarah, Sarah Woodling had done his dirty deed. Because I'm not really impressed with him. He's not my favourite kind of person. The kind who would get so meltingly drunk that he'd run someone off the road, explode their car into a pool of flames, and then uh, not even have the decency to call it in to the, the duty office. Because he's probably got like contacts. I'm, I'm guessing he's going to be involved in the police. It's just a guess. It's, it's, uh, um, he shifted into high, moving rapidly down the lesser grade on the other side into town. No car came his way. He drove more temperately along Rock City's main street. If only he had done that sooner, along Rock City's main street, and finally stopped at the curb about a block from Timothy's Bar and Grill. He leaned forward to turn off the ignition switch and realised that his hands had been gripping the wheels so tightly they were clamped there. He had difficulty loosening his grip. Uh, it was a crisp, cool, moonlit night, but Sarah was drenched with sweat as he walked past, as he walked along the sidewalk towards Timothy's. Drenched, the man drenched. The, the fat, lippy, jowly man, drenched with, with his one eye open or closed, depending on which way he's looking at it. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a picture. That uh, Judson Phillips has created for us. Crisp, cool moon at night, but Sarah was drenched with sweat as he walked along the sidewalk towards Timothy's. His mind was perfectly clear now. Sorry, <laughs> nothing like running someone off the road and killing them in a ball of flame to sober you up. <laughs> of course, that would that would also want to be combined with a sweat drenching. <laughs> Bit of a sweat drenching. And the shock of what had happened seemed to have dissolved his double vision. That's handy. He walked the rolling, shambling walk so familiar to rock cityites, to Timothy's, and down the two steps from the sidewalk into the basement bar. There were only a couple of customers in the bar a man and a woman seated in one of the rear booths. And uh, despite this being a book, it seems they've booked extras <laughs> for the uh, rolls there. <laughs> Timothy, a scrawny, bold Irishman, who sang a young voice earlier. Might not have been too off. New York, Irishman. Well, would he be fully Irish? I mean, this is the 60s in America. Do they mean, uh, could he, could he, you know, he could be properly Irish, or he could be just like American Irish, um, like McNulty in The Wire, who's supposed to be Irish. But actually, he's an English actor playing an American who has Irish origin. Um, he's a scrawny, bold Irishman, not, not McNulty, Timothy. It's a scrawny, bold Irishman with a perpetual tobacco stained grin. He was polishing glasses. So, what should we go for? Hi, Your Honour. Hi, Your Honour, he said cheerfully. Good evening, Timothy. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> That's not the voice. Good evening, Timothy, <laughs> said the American detective. Um, and Sayer said, surprised himself by the night. I'm going to actually read this out loud because, you know, this is how this is, this is really happening like this. Good evening, Timothy, 
Sayer said, surprised himself by the naturalness of his voice. <laughs> That's written there. Photograph it and show you. <laughs> the usual, Timothy asked. I, I, I prefer Timothy as uh, an American, so. Um, the usual, Timothy asked. Sayer looked at the booth. Yes, yes, Sayer. What was our sale with talking? This is going to be confusing to me to do all the voices, but you know, we'll get through it, we'll get through it. Um, Sayer glanced at the booth. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's not a frog. A rare hamburger and a carton of milk. And while you're getting it, Timothy, I could do with a double bourbon on the rocks. My pleasure, Your Honour, Timothy said. They'd been able to get clear of the rare. I hope there's not a lot of talking in this. They'd been able to get. <laughs> What's he having anyway? He's having a bourbon. Uh, my pleasure, Your Honour, Timothy said. They'd been able to get clear of the wreck before the fire consumed them. Oh, had they been able to get clear of the wreck before the fire consumed them? Sayer wondered. He took a. He took a soiled handkerchief out of his hip pocket and ran it around the inside of his wilted collar. A sentence there that. Judson's been thinking about. I'll have to give it, give it a second read. He took a soiled handkerchief out of his hip pocket and ran it around the inside of his wilted collar. Hot in here, Timothy, Sayer said, as the double bourbon slid across the bar toward him. I hadn't noticed, Timothy said, who uh, Timothy started to become more and more confused about his his accent. Maybe it's my blood pressure, Sayer said, mangling a chuckle. <laughs> Managing a chuckle, sorry. Managing a chuckle. Town seems quiet tonight. Most everyone's over at a carnival in Lathrop, Timothy said. They're raffling off a couple of cars. Last two nights, you know, I might as well have closed up and gone over myself what a business I found. He nodded towards the couple in the booth and lowered his voice. Two beers and a whole package of potato chips in the last hour. <laughs> you can fucking complain that you're his only customers. No wonder he doesn't get customers. Because if I was the only person in a bar and I heard the barman complaining about my order after I'd supported, you know, I'd embarrassed about sitting in his empty bar, um, you know, if that's the gratitude. <laughs> fucking potato chips. Whatever became of the ice cream parlor, Judge? He wants to know. Not a part of my, not a part of my experience, Timothy. I could stand one more double shot if you'd be so kind. Pleasure. We don't often get your serious business, Judge. Can't allow you to have an entirely unprofitable evening, Sir said. Perhaps a dash of bitters. My stomach's acting up a little. Sarah had just taken his first swallow of the second bourbon. Spiked with Angostura. I like Angostura as a word. Angostura. Angostura bitters. Spiked with Angostura. When a siren sounded outside on Main Street, a, stri a state trooper's car went racing past Timothy's windows at top speed, headed for Cobbs Hill. Almost immediately afterward, the phone back of Timothy's, the phone back of Timothy's bar rang. There's another word missing here. This is. This, it should say almost immediately afterward. The phone at the back of Timothy's bar rang. Timothy answered. This whisper town here. Actually, when you look at it, it does look a little bit like someone's made this book themselves in some way. Must be a Ruby Cam again. I'll show you some pictures of the actual book there because it looks like someone's written on it. Whisper Town on the spine. And they've like literally just cut out this picture and stuck it on this cover. So I don't know what's going on, I don't know why, why they've done that. There's some words missing in the actual text. So. Let's see when this chapter finishes. Pages, you know, we, we, we've nearly done half an hour, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to put a bookmark in it there. And um, Ruby, you can't see Ruby anymore because uh, she's making 
little noise there <laughs> because um, the Ruby camera's just run out of sight. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to put a little bookmark in it there um, and we'll come back and find out. Um, I'm not, not cheekily, just, I'm cheekily just weaving it before, because uh, it's a bit like Game of Thrones, isn't it? You know, and you want to know what's going to happen, so I shouldn't read it before you find out. I'm not going to jump ahead of you, I'm going to keep it fresh for, for me too. Um, so yeah, what's happening is a state trooper's car went racing past Timothy's windows at top speed, headed for Cobbs Hill. Almost immediately afterwards, the phone at the back of Timothy's bar rang. Timothy answered. So, you know... I'm not saying anything because uh, I haven't really looked too far ahead, but that that could be interesting. The call that Timothy takes there, and um, our main man, our flabby, uh, flabby blah 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 blah, smoking a cigar. I'm a flabby blah blah blah. That man um, is uh, worried because he's run someone off the road and potentially killed them. <laughs> so <laughs> I hope that's been a relaxing bedtime story. <laughs> and. Uh, um, I hope you don't have a you know, nightmare about a car crash. Because <laughs> I described my eye as well, didn't I? So, uh, I don't, you know, don't worry about that. I banged my face on the steering wheel and did my nose as well at the same time. I was young and foolish. I wasn't driving at a high speed. I was just turning the car. This one hit, hit my car, so. Cars are dangerous. Uh, but that's not the message I need to take from this. Um, Whisper Town is available only through me on the internet. Um, Judson Phillips, his red badge mystery novel, uh, is not available in any shops. It might, it might be. You know what? I'll give you the ISBN. Uh, no, I won't because I think it's gone. Um, but. And to be honest, I don't want you reading ahead. I want to be uh, bringing it to you fresh. So. That's chapter. That's part one. What I'm probably going to do now, because I'm enjoying this so much, without the restriction of worrying about the background noise and stuff like that, um, and having it quite lo-fi, um, and actually talking to you in my real voice, it's been quite fun. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is probably just record the next chapter of this, and then just post it. A little bit down the line. Cheeky, huh? Some cheeky stuff. Yeah, I might not. I might have a break and uh, come back to it. But because what I've got to do is I've got to get this into the computer and edit it. Edit those pictures I was talking about. And probably do something. To go to sleep to sort my eye out. It's probably a good one as well. Doesn't make me look the best. But it's way past midnight, man. Yeah. We'll be on sleep. Whisper time. And if you, uh, <laughs> if you get. If you don't, if you prefer my whispering videos, then don't worry, I will make more whispering videos. Um, yeah. I'm going to do all sorts of stuff. It's all going to be cool. It's all going to be good, don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. It'll be a good morning, podcast. <laughs>